Conversations on MS. We're streaming live from the lovely Art Center in Grand Junction, Colorado. Thank you to everyone who's attending in person, and thank you to everyone online. We're here tonight to talk about MS with Dr. John Corboy. I'm Kelsey Morrow, Education Manager for the Rocky Mountain MS Center. I would also like to thank the pharmaceutical companies who have provided patient education grants to support this series. Thank you to Bristol-Myers Squibb and Genentech. Uh, this series is just one piece of our education programming. We have a variety of formats, including um, both in-person and online, as well as on-demand things. Almost all of our programming is available on our YouTube channel. Uh, if you would like to be uh, invited to our educational programs, we announce them through our mailing list, our Facebook group. Um, if you sign up for notifications through Eventbrite, um, all of those are options, and every education program is free of charge to anyone interested. Uh, so I'm going to introduce you to Dr. John Corboy. He is the director of the Rocky Mountain MS Center at University of Colorado, a multidisciplinary group offering state-of-the-art care and research to MS patients. Um, and I'll just remind folks, we did have a lot of good questions um, submitted at registration. We'll get to as many of them as we can. All decisions regarding MS treatment and uh, medications should be discussed with your own neurologist. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Corboy. Great, thanks everybody for coming tonight in person and also on, um, on the webinar. We appreciate everybody's time and we know their time is valuable, so thanks. Um, I think there are a lot of questions which I'd like to get to first and that would maybe cover a lot of things I would otherwise cover if I was just gonna speak spontaneously anyway. And so um, we can just dig right in. And also, this is very informal. If you have a question, you can raise your hand pretty much any time. Uh, you can send it through the chat. So please feel free. Uh, there's, no, there's no bad question. Um, so the first question, uh, and these came from people who sent these in uh, mostly ahead of time. Uh, the first question has to do with uh, relapses in a broad sense, and specifically optic neuritis. Optic neuritis is when you have inflammation in the optic nerve. And it's a very common uh, early sign of MS, commonly seen as a relapse. We don't see uh, really people having slow worsening of loss of vision over time, typically. But it's a clinical syndrome uh, associated with pain with eye movement, loss of vision, blurred vision. Um, and uh, otherwise, it acts like a relapse. It sort of peaks over several days. It stays about the same. And then it can improve spontaneously or after steroids. And uh, for relapses in general, for optic neuritis in particular, not everybody recovers completely from an optic neuritis acute relapse. In the, uh, a lot of the early clinical trials, people measured how many people actually went back to their baseline uh, after a relapse. And in younger patients, it's probably about uh, 25 to 30% of people who don't. So most people do. They go back to their baseline level of function clinically. That doesn't mean there wasn't something that was seen on an MRI scan that might cause a problem uh, potentially later, but in, in general, people recover well. As people get older, they have less relapses <clears throat> and perhaps less severe relapses, but they don't tend to recover quite as well. So uh, do th things do change over time, like a lot of things with MS. But the question uh, that we had primarily here was, what about after that? What about fluctuations in symptoms that can occur? And the classic fluctuation with optic neuritis is that you might get into a hot tub or it's just a hot day outside and you're exercising or just out in the yard gardening or whatever. And as your body core temperature goes up, if you had a prior optic neuritis, you may actually have your vision get dim again. And then when you go inside, you cool off, get a cold drink, uh, your vision will come back. And that actually has a term, it's called Utosh phenomenon. And there are other things that can also cause fluctuations in symptoms. Uh, and that is just general fatigue can do that, but also infections, viral infections, uh, urinary tract infections and others. So you can see after a relapse, it's not uncommon at all for people to have fluctuations in symptoms, but when, <clears throat> but when they're uh, just in the same distribution as before and they clear once you remove whatever that stressor is, either the heat or infection or whatever it may be, and the term we use for that, and it's a terrible term, but it's the best term we have so far, is a pseudo attack or pseudo relapse. There's nothing pseudo about the symptoms. The symptoms are quite real, uh, but they don't cause like a new lesion on a scan, and they're temporary. They generally will go away. Uh, the exception to that 
is when people, uh, perhaps if they're a bit more disabled uh, and they have a more significant infection, say urosepsis, that is you have urinary tract infection where the bacteria then gets into the blood and sepsis is a fear, serious, potentially life-threatening illness. Uh, those patients can end up in the hospital for days or weeks and they get severely deconditioned and they would not really necessarily go back to where they were beforehand. It leaves a mark. Uh, you can do physical therapy and other things to try and uh, get better depending upon what the issues were, oftentimes walking and leg strength. But uh, a significant infection like that, even if it doesn't have changes on your scan, can be associated with uh, what looks like a true attack and it really is probably just that the patient is uh, very um, likely to get deconditioned very rapidly and very significantly. So fluctuations after an acute attack or fluctuations in symptoms when people may have slow progression of their symptoms as they age are very common and, uh, and may even change over the course of a day. Um, there was another whole uh, body of questions related to the concept of, well, what about progressive MS? And a progressive MS we think of as just one phase of MS. It turns out that in the old days, we used to think that when people are young, they had a lot of relapses, and then they may or may not have more relapses as they get older, usually much less. Uh, but then some subset of people would have slow worsening of their symptoms often associated with problems with walking, leg strength, bowel and bladder function, cognitive function, um, and that that was sort of restricted almost to uh, people who uh, were older. Uh, the reality is, is that even when people are younger, the majority of people that do have uh, so-called progression on their exam, and we can measure this uh, in various different ways, but we often use something called the EDSS, Expanded Disability Status Scale, it's a 10 point scale and movement of one point on that scale is considered significant. So in clinical trials, if you look at people, even in younger trial, you know, younger relapsing MS patient trials, so people are on average age 35, 38 on average, um, when people have progression of, of one point or more on the scale during the study, you would have thought it was mostly due to having a relapse. You know, they had a relapse, they got worse and you can measure that. The reality is, is that even in that context, the majority of people are having progression that is independent of relapse activity. So even when people are young, if they are having progression of disability, which is less common, uh, most of the time it is actually not related to having relapse. So this, this uh, concept of progression independent of relapse activity um, has really evolved over the last five to seven or years or so. And it really has made us rethink of MS differently uh, as opposed to sort of this two-pronged thing, relapses when you're on, young, progression when you're old. It's really that it's a, it's a combination of the two and there can be a uh, progression of disability even when people are young. And then when people are young, that's also highlighted by these relapses, which are uh, very obvious to people because those are abrupt changes. So this has had a fundamentally uh, important uh, effect on the whole way we think about MS and how, what we might look at an imaging on MS, for example, because progression is associated with a couple of things we don't usually look at on MRI scans. So it can be associated with things called phase rim lesions or paramagnetic rim lesions or pearls, um, which are rings of mostly inactive uh, lesions related to MS, but there's a ring of so-called macrophages and microglia around these uh, around that rim and uh, this is associated with a different fundamentally different kind of inflammation than we're used to thinking about with ms you can also have so-called slowly expanding lesions and they can actually be both the same slowly expanding and with these uh, paramagnetic rims and although these two approaches on the mri scan are not really commercially used uh, typically they probably will be coming into vogue over the next several years. And that would be one way that we can help try and get an idea of whether or not someone actually is having slow progression, because we do not do a great job understanding, when I say we, the doctors, understanding when people are having slow progression and trying to respond to that. And so uh, we, we need markers on MRI scans. We need markers in blood. And there's some evidence that some of the blood biomarkers may be very good if they are 
showing signs of distress inside the nervous system, damage to the cells inside the nervous system. They can leak some proteins out that we can actually see in the blood or spinal fluid. And at least one neurofilament light, uh, which is a protein in the axon, a cable that connects one nerve to another. Um, it's a protein. If you damage the nerve axon, then you can see leakage of that. And you can measure that. That seems to be something that um, is associated with having acute relapses, the acute inflammation that we think about, especially in younger patients. But something called GFAP, gliofibrillary acidic protein, is actually part of astrocytes, which are supportive cells of the brain cells. And um, elevations in that may be actually more important in progressive MS. If you have a very high level of that, that may be actually predictive of having progression independent of relapse activity. So the question that the patient asked, uh, the, the participant asked previously was, what about, what about progressive MS? Uh, what is it and how, how do we manifest it and how can we measure it? And so it is typically seen, as I mentioned, more commonly seen in older individuals, but can be seen in younger individuals. And it's just slow worsening, typically of gait, bowel and bladder function, cognitive function, and other things potentially, balance problems. And, um, uh, and is associated with a different pathological substrate. And as I mentioned, potentially different MRI uh, findings. Um, and importantly, um, that portion of MS is unfortunately just not as responsive to the therapeutic uh, options that we have available, the so-called disease-modifying therapies that we have now. They are all uh, developed against the inflammation that we see primarily with people who have relapses, and they're extremely effective at that. We, at, at this point in time, we can pretty much, using any of several different drugs, pretty much shut down relapses almost completely uh, not completely, but almost completely. Uh, whereas we, we really don't have great options uh, for slow progression because it is a different pathology. So, um, uh, so we, we need to sort of uh, try to recognize this as early as possible. We need to uh, treat the symptoms as much as possible. And there are a variety of symptoms that we can treat well. Uh, but we also most importantly need to do research that is beyond just using the types of inf uh, anti-inflammatory approaches that we've been using for the last 30 plus years now. And so other approaches that might be useful would be to have those approaches that are immunologically based, but directed against these microglia that I mentioned before. These are resident immune cells that live inside the nervous system. And there are cells that are similar in nature in other organs, like in the liver, they're called Kupfer cells. Uh, but they are mostly scavenger cells of one particular lineage of, lineage of um, bone marrow derived cells. And they are scavengers, but they're also inflammatory cells themselves. And they can rotate between different phases uh, based on how they're stimulated in their natural environment inside the brain and spine. But we need therapies that are directed immunologically against those kinds of molecules, not just against those circulating white blood cells that get uh, get activated typically in the blood and the lymph nodes and then circulate into the nervous system. These are resident inside the nervous system and that compartmentalized inflammation, it seems is most important in progressive MS. So approaches beyond just trying to attack the immune system with regard to uh, altering microglia it could include uh, protecting nerve cells from dying if there's a partially damaged nerve cell. Could you, in fact, uh, use various medications to um, let that cell survive longer? Could you support the energy production inside that cell uh, or any of a variety of things that would allow that cell to live longer? Uh, then that would potentially be quite helpful. And for example, uh, this month, so it should be over now, uh, the last patient last visit is in a study in Europe, the second phase three trial, looking at um, simvastatin, Zocor, one of the classic cholesterol drugs as a potential agent to treat progressive MS by being neuroprotective. It would, have, would help support cells that are dying. And uh, in a preliminary phase three trial, it was found to potentially benefit with less brain shrinkage uh, of uh, individuals with progressive MS compared to people taking placebo. And then also on things that we can measure, the EDSS that I measured 
I mentioned before, measurements of that were also uh, showed less worsening. Um, in addition, uh, there are other medications that have been uh, potentially will be able to co-op from other areas that might be neuroprotective. Metformin, an older uh, diabetes drug that's been around for many years, oral, uh, well-known side effect profile and cheap, uh, may be neuroprotective and there are studies looking at that as an add-on agent. And then also interestingly, uh, several of the weight loss drugs like, like um, uh, Wigovi and the other ones, the GLP-1 uh, medications that are so much in the news for weight loss these days may also be neuroprotective uh, with a different type of uh, approach than what is useful for weight loss and for diabetes. So neuroprotection would be one approach. A second approach would be perhaps for, for progressive MS would be to help remyelinate the nerves. The nerves are these cables and they have a fatty proteinaceous substance called myelin that is part of the target for MS. And if you could, if there's damage to that, and if you could fix the myelin, there are, there is fixing a myelin that does occur, but it's, it's inhibited. It's not as good as it should be. And so there are approaches now that have been able to at least show modestly that you can have some level of remyelination now, clinically, it has not proven to be of any significant benefit, but we can measure both on MRI scan and electrically, because if you demyelinate a nerve, it doesn't conduct electricity as quickly. You can measure that, and we can show that there's improvement in damaged nerves with electrical function, but also that you can see on MRI scan that there's some remyelination that occurs as well. So remyelinating approaches would be potentially helpful, noting that you're going to need to do that early, because once a cell has died and dropped out, you can't, there's nothing to myelinate. So you have to use that presumably when someone is younger, but then maybe throughout their lifetime. But then finally, another approach would be regeneration. Could you in fact grow nervous system tissue inside human brains and spines? And these studies are just starting now. And when I was in training, we were told that the cells that were necessary to regrow nerve tissue, say after a stroke or with a brain tumor or something else like that, or in MS, that the cells that would be needed to do that repair and regeneration didn't exist. In fact, that's totally false. Uh, and it's been well described now that, that the cells that are needed, uh, these uh, so-called neural progenitor cells are sitting there inside your nervous system, but they are inhibited. They cannot uh, repair as well, say when you cut your skin or if you damage some other organ internally. Um, uh, we just don't have that capacity like we do in other organ systems. So can we unleash that in any way? Can we stimulate those cells that are already there? Or can we simply replace those cells? And so there have been a number of small studies, two in Italy and two in the United States, looking at ways to take uh, so-called neural precursor cells. And you get these typically two ways. Um, the original uh, ones were done with, um, with uh, uh, stem cells taken from miscarried uh, fetuses, and you can just literally get them from the brain. Uh, but more recently, also using what's called inducible pluripotent stem cells, you can take cells that are in other organs, typically, and this is abdominal fat is where you can get these. And these are cells that are stem cells. Uh, they're stem cells that are sort of along one lineage, but you can treat them in such a way that they go backwards to become a, what's called a pluripotent stem cell, treat them another way, and they go down a different lineage that would make them neural precursor cells. So these are called inducible pluripotent stem cells that you actually make from other organs, essentially. And, um, and so someone won the Nobel Prize for just discovering that about 15 years ago. But now you can use those cells, and there are several studies that have shown uh, very early just ways that you might do that. And you essentially uh, grow these cells up. You would then um, uh, inject them either into the spinal fluid in the back, sort of a reverse spinal tap, or you can put a port on top of the skull, and, and you can um, uh, put the port straight down into the ventricle, which is in the middle of the brain where the spinal fluid is made. And you could deliver the cells directly into the spinal fluid where it would then circulate over the brain and spine. And then the hope is that those cells will survive, that they will attach to nervous system tissue, that they will 
then move through tissue, through the brain and spine to areas where there's damage, that they will stop at an area of damage, set up shop, and either stimulate the cells that are presently there to actually go on and become fully differentiated and be, make new nervous system tissue, or they themselves would become new nervous system tissue, could be both. So those are very early studies, but that would have been, um, that would have been crazy talk if we had had that discussion 30 years ago, and now it's, it's beyond science fiction, now it's science. So we'll see where that goes, but that would be a way that you would potentially uh, treat progressive MS uh, by repairing a regenerating nervous system tissue. So all of those approaches are under study. Uh, it is the greatest unmet need for MS. And, uh, and I'm very hopeful that over the course of the next several years, uh, we'll really have a breakthrough in one or more of those areas so that we can see that there's potentially uh, something that's quite useful. So right now, um, the next thing that's potentially available that would be potentially affecting the microglia that I mentioned before are so-called uh, BTK inhibitors, brutin, tyrosine kinase inhibitors. These are enzyme inhibitors. Kinases are uh, enzymes that transfer a phosphate group from one molecule to another molecule. It sounds very innocuous. It is actually very innocuous, but this is a major way that cellular functions throughout your body are controlled. And it's like a trigger switch that starts off. There's a stimulus that interacts with a receptor on the outside of a cell. It triggers an enzymatic reaction inside the cell. And then a whole cascade of things occur in the outer rim of the cell, but also deep in the nucleus of the cell. And you can have fundamentally very different things that the best cell will do. It'll differentiate, it'll emit certain secretions itself. It'll interact with other cells. And this is true all over your body, but also these particular enzymes in this particular group affect both B lymphocytes, as we see with drugs like Ocaris and Rituximab and Asimta, but also, uh, also potentially have the, uh, an impact on microglia, which would potentially help people with progressive MS. So there are a number of studies in phase three um, uh, uh, status right now. Phase three are the, st are the studies that if they are successful and they show safety as well as efficacy, you can then go to the FDA for approval. So several of these drugs which have been borrowed from other parts of medicine, as we frequently do in our world. Um, they are in phase three trials, and we will see whether or not they're helpful for both progressive and relapsing MS. The first study that, was, uh, that came out in a relapsing population of younger patients, average age about 37 or so, um, showed that there was benefit that was seen, but was no greater than was seen with Abajo, which is considered one of our more modest medi medications. And so um, that was a little bit disheartening. That was in December. Uh, but there are multiple other drugs in this category uh, that are, as I say, far along the phase three trials. And we're still really um, hopeful that they'll have an impact in progressive MS. Um, all right. Um, did anybody have any questions about that, that kind of stuff? Yeah, go ahead, Gary. You talked about the slow progressive MS. Mm -hmm. And I, I thought I picked up that the lesions, there's, there's a ring around lesions that you now think might be indicator of, of slow progression MS. Right. So-called paramagnetic rims. And so this, it's actually, there's a rim around what you can see. And these, these would be brain lesions. These are correct? brain or spine, but typically we see them easier oh, so you, on the brain. And they're laden with uh, both iron, but also these macrophages and microglia in the rims. And that's what you're picking up on the scans. Okay. So if, if you're diagnosed to be you know, free from new relapses in MS, can you still be in slow progression even though, okay. Yeah, and, that, and actually that is the norm. So most people where we are overtly seeing slow progression, it's, it's people after about age 35 to 40, 45, and who are really having very few relapses overall. That, that is the norm. Now, not everybody gets that. Some people just have relapses when they're young and then, that just stops and then that's where they are. But some and people go into progressive phase. Degradation of balance and bowel function could be an indicator that you are in this slow progression, Absolutely. even though you're not seeing 
major lesions. In fact, you will see typically on the regular MRI scans we get in the office, you will see no changes. And so when people are young, if you're especially untreated, even without symptoms, 90 to 95% of new lesions that are seen on scans, no symptoms at all. Um, only about 5% either have scan changes or associated with actual relapses. As you transition and get older, some people have progressive MS, not all. And we think now many less than before because of the effective therapies that are available. Um, typically, you see the opposite. People are slowly worsening. They're worsening. Everybody can see they're worsening. The patient sees it. Their spouse sees it. We see it. And yet the scans are unchanging. So it's complete, completely flipped. So there's two different mismatches at different phases of people's life with MS, uh, with the MRI scans. So that's the norm. Thank you. Um, so related to that, especially for progressive MS, uh, if you know, some of the medicines are, are not adequate, they don't do a good job at slowing down this, this progression that we described, what are other things you can do? Well, there are a variety of things you can do. Um, and uh, they fall into uh, lifestyle issues and they fall into what I call good behaviors. Um, uh, so one uh, good behavior is just take care of your body. So, you know, uh, see your doctor regularly, your, G your GP regularly, you know, get your cholesterol checked. Uh, women, get your mammograms, get your colonoscopies, all those things to make sure your general health is good. And if you have comorbidities, other conditions, diabetes, high blood pressure, spine issues, hip knee issues, orthopedic issues are a big one as well, then just to treat those aggressively. Sometimes the orthopedists are a little reluctant, for example, to put a new knee or a new hip in one of our patients. And I'm like, no, our patients should be at the top of the list because this is something you can address and fix. And then you can help their walking and then they can exercise more and then they can really do much better with their MS. So we, we have a lot of discussions with the orthopedist about that. Um, but at the top of the list, after treating comorbidities and, and just, you know, good diet, there's no specific diet for MS, but just generally a healthy diet. And there, you know, there may be more data that comes out about diets over time. There was just a recent study that suggested that uh, the intermittent fasting may be useful. And the way this study was done, uh, they looked at a marker that's known to be associated with, with, uh, with more problems with MS called leptin. And it's uh, seen uh, actually in obesity as well. And uh, they showed that if you did intermittent fasting twice a week, that is restricting your calories to 500 or less and, and only eating a certain list of vegetables for those two days, uh, that you could markedly reduce this leptin uh, in your blood. Now, whether or not that translates in the long term to better MS, we don't know yet, but that's an example of one kind of thing that is being studied. So, but excellent sleep, uh, decent diet, uh, stay as close to your ideal body weight as, po as possible, exercise, exercise, exercise. And this is not unique to MS. It's well known in Parkinson's disease, for example, that uh, exercise plays a huge role in how people function and uh, retaining mobility, reducing falls, uh, less fatigue, and any of a number of other things that are really pertinent to both Parkinson's as well as MS. Um, you know, associated with that, you know, PT may be helpful. We heard a few minutes ago uh, about hippotherapy. There's horse therapy. It's helpful for a lot of things. First of all, it helps with social engagement. Um, uh, it actually is sort of similar to yoga and other things like that that will uh, allow you to work on your balance. Sitting on a horse, you can fall off pretty easy. It requires a significant amount of balance to actually stay on a horse. It requires core strength, requires balance. And so it's good for that, as is yoga. So there are a variety of different types of therapies that can be helpful. Uh, exercising not just your body, but exercising your brain. Um, and everybody will do this differently. Some people like to listen to opera. Some people like to do crossword puzzles. Uh, some people uh, like to just uh, go to a book club. Some people would do any of a number of things, Sudoku. All of those things that exercise your brain as well as your body are especially helpful. And there is documented uh, benefit from doing those things. Related to several of those things are social engagement. There are a number of studies that show that social engagement is um, 
is restricted in people with chronic conditions in general, and certainly with multiple sclerosis. And that plays an important role um, in, uh, in just how you function in general. Uh, but happiness, uh, frailty, those are issues that can become more of an issue as you age. And social engagement, remaining socially engaged is extremely important. So uh, those are a lot of the main things. And then one important one is if you smoke, quit. Uh, smoking has been linked to not only development of MS, but also a worse outcome with MS if you, uh, if you continue to smoke. So uh, I would certainly uh, strongly urge any smokers with MS to, uh, and any other people smoking, I'd urge to stop smoking because it's, it's just bad for everything. Um, Let's see. All right, someone asked a specific question. Oh, any questions about that? Lifestyle issues, other good behaviors, things like that? Okay. Um, there was a question about, and I'm not sure, and, I'll, uh, and I don't know if the person's here, I'll ask them to maybe clarify it a little bit. I asked about, um, here's the question. If a speech disorder, misarticulations occurs, in what stage is that of the disease? Uh, is, it most uh, is it most common? And I have secondary progressive MS, and that was just what the question was. So I'm not sure if they meant if there was slurring of speech, garbled speech. Um, that can occur anytime with MS because it can, you can have an MS attack or a slow progression affecting the motor function of your mouth. And uh, uh, so slurring of speech, so an actual articulation problem can occur anytime. Uh, but they may have the, the the questioner may have been asking the question uh, more about sort of um, word finding, misnaming things, um, trouble uh, finding the words that you like to say what you uh, are trying to get across to whomever you're speaking with. Um, those are, are part of uh, typical patterns that we see of, of some cognitive impairment uh, with MS that is also again common in when people are young, but definitely more common when people are older and can absolutely slowly uh, progress over time. Um, and uh, the analogy is that uh, it's like having a uh, slower computer. You have the five or the 10 year old computer, you don't have the new one. And so everything's in there. Uh, however, it's very difficult to uh, express that or to get that out or to find some word you're looking for. Um, you eventually get it. Usually when somebody walks away and you start talking to yourself about what was I not saying, um, but the uh, that is generally more common when people are older, uh, but can be seen when people are younger. And the manifestations can be significant. Uh, they can impair social engagement. They can impair uh, work. Um, perhaps you know there's there's two broad ways that uh, people uh, in our world will uh, end up applying for disability. Uh, one is an obvious physical impairment um, uh, that limits their ability to work. But the other is cognitive impairment. We have quite a few people who physically can still continue to perform any variety of different jobs, but cognitively they are uh, struggling, especially if they're in a, a job that is more cognitively based than physically based. And so uh, sometimes cognitive testing can be extremely important to help identify that because you may not appreciate that. You may meet someone at a party or uh, out to dinner you've never met and you're talking to them, they seem perfectly fine. Uh, but that person can actually be struggling quite a bit with their cognitive function uh, because a lot of that is uh, below the surface. Uh, they know the difference and their employer will know the difference. And we especially see this in businesses where people do a lot of heavily detailed work, uh, accountants, for example, incredible amounts of uh, just detail that they deal with every day, all day. Uh, they're, they're just a um, uh, machine going through uh, all these calculations uh, all of which allow them to potentially make mistakes. And so um, uh, people who have very detailed, cognitively oriented uh, positions in their career, it can be very challenging. Uh, and we sometimes can uh, uh, quantify that with cognitive testing. Um, there was a question about fecal incontinence. Uh, so you can have incontinence of bladder, which is relatively common for MS, and there are a variety of ways that that can happen. Uh, fecal incontinence is uh, less common, but um, perhaps more disturbing to many people. Uh, and it can happen for um, a couple of reasons. 
uh, the um, uh, the main thing typically is that uh, someone will uh, either have urgency, just like they would, would with their bladder, uh, but it's with their bowels, and they literally just can't get to the um, to the bathroom fast enough. The other is that they may not have the they may, may not feel the sensation that actually uh, that's occurring while their bowels are starting to move. Our bowels are are not completely on autopilot. Obviously, we control them after however many years when we, when we all got diaper trained. Um, but uh, uh, they are, in many respects, there are a lot of reflexes that occur. There's a, the, the simplest reflex is you eat something and the, gas, the gastrocolic reflex, your stomach expands to send a signal to your colon to evacuate so you can make room for the food that's coming in. This is a, a simple reflex. And there are other reflexes as well as the bowel sort of expands. There's reflexes that uh, stimulate you to um, uh, have the sensation to move your bowels. So people can either lose that sensation or they literally the, the, uh, the amount of um, uh, activity from a motor point of view, the motor portion of the bowel is just so fast they just can't make it to the bathroom in time. Um, this is a challenging thing to deal with. It's not, as, it's not a very common problem. Much more common with the bowel is constipation or sometimes constipation alternating with diarrhea. And we never want to do anything uh, with medications especially that would potentially induce uh, further problems with constipation because that can be a, a real problem for people. So the main thing we do when people have urge incontinence with their bowels is we really just try and train the bowels and you can use the gastrocolic reflex to your advantage. You can use um, uh, drugs. The most commonly used drug in the world is caffeine. Uh, and caffeine is clearly associated with stimulation of your bowel to move your bowels. And so um, you can train your bowels literally by, for example, getting up in the morning, having a cup of coffee, eating breakfast, and then literally going to the bathroom and sitting there trying to train your bowels that you move them on a regular basis the same time every day. And that is often effective uh, for uh, trying to uh, help avoid uh, fecal incontinence because you would have uh, trained and uh, uh, made your bowel sort of responsive to the stimulus that you give them. But there's no medication that we, we really want to do to slow down your bowels. That would be a bad idea in many respects. Sometimes you can use fiber and things to expand your bowels that may increase the um, stimulus that your uh, bowel is uh, sending um, uh, so that you can, in fact, potentially uh, move and control your bowels. Um, there was a question about brain volume and shrinkage. And the question was, could brain volume and shrinkage be added to the brain MRI scan reports? And, and the answer is, yeah, we do them all the time with ours. Ours are 100% uh, associated with that um, when you get our scans done at our place. Uh, but there are others as well. So Simon Wed is one is in Denver that does them. Not everybody does them. These are highly automated and they uh, require you to get the, you know, to pay whatever the, the service fee is to use the sequences on the MRI scan to do it. And then you do various sequences, uh, specific sequences. They're not particularly fancy in order to do them. You do them a certain way. And uh, there's at least two different um, uh, commercially available ones, uh, NeuroQuant, uh, uh, computer packages. Uh, NeuroQuant is one, and then Icometrics is another. Uh, we use uh, Icometrics now. We previously used NeuroQuant. And they can tell you about the brain volume in general, uh, the whole brain volume. And they can also tell you about specific areas. And, um, and why do we care about brain volume? Uh, we care about brain volume because it's one of the most important indicators of how you're going to do with your MS uh, is brain volume. Um, there was one young man in the back, but he's gone. So I think I can say without fear of contradiction, 100% of the people in this room have a shrinking brain, including me. And that starts at about age 30 everybody's brain starts to shrink. Uh, with people with MS, it shrinks uh, somewhat more rapidly and variably. Some people relatively more rapidly, others less. And there's now early studies looking at shrinkage in the spine as well. Uh, a little bit more behind on the spine uh, imaging. 
but we know that that's very important for how people do in the long run with their MS. And so uh, that's the reason why we care. There are uh, computer se sequences that can allow you to get that information. And then it's important to know what we actually can learn and what we don't learn from it. So what we can learn is, uh, is the, way this, this way the studies get reported, either with the whole brain or when you look at specific areas, it will tell you how big is that whole brain or that particular area how big is that compared to uh, sex and age match individuals? So I just told you that um, everybody's brain shrinks after age 30 or so. So you have to take into account what the normal shrinkage is. And then also uh, your brain is uh, going to be related to size. And men are just women and bigger than women. So men have bigger brains. Doesn't mean we're smarter, obviously. Um, many people argue clearly not. And, uh, and uh, but you have to you have to uh, compare it. It really should be more size matched than age matched, or, or excuse me, sex matched, because there are certainly six foot tall women and there's five foot tall men. So uh, uh, it should be really size matched and age matched. Um, and then what you get is you, so for example, uh, if your brain, let's say use your whole brain volume, comes up, the number says 50th percentile. That means that 50% of people of your sex and your age have a bigger, or in this case, also a smaller brain, 50%, because you're dead middle. If it's 5%, that means that 95% of people have a bigger brain than you do. And so um, you can f get a very good general idea of person's uh, brain biome, both globally with whole brain biomes or in specific areas by doing these uh, these quantitative computer metrics. Um, and you can follow them over time. But the important thing to keep in mind, the limitations of this, is that um, if you do even the same scan on the same person, on the same scanner, on the same day, you may get different numbers. Because you could wake up in the morning and be dehydrated, drink and have your test done, and then drink a liter of Gatorade and you get a different result if you repeat the test. So it's subject to a lot of variability having to do with hydration, medications, and a variety of other things. So just looking at one person from year to year to year, um, there's so much variability that it's not a very useful test. Now, when you look at populations, and so if you have a thousand person study, and 500 people get drug A and 500 people get drug B, you can wash out a lot of that variation. You can measure differences between group A and group B of even down to 0.1%. Uh, you can really, so the, the, it's very useful in that context. It is not that useful for one individual from year to year to year, unless you can, unless you can see that, you know, that year one, it's, you know, 50th percentile, year two, it's, 45, at year three, it's 40, at year four, it's 35, et cetera. If it's clearly trending down and you have many years to make a graph of it, that could be useful. But there's otherwise so much fluctuation that it's, it's really hazardous to look at two numbers a year apart and then make any strong conclusion from it. So um, if you do happen to get your scans done <clears throat> where there is quantitative uh, ability to look at brain volumes, uh, uh, it's, uh, you have to remember what the limitations are. I use it mostly in, in our context for having an idea of globally where somebody is. Um, uh, and so the, the thing that is the norm in MS is that when you are young, your brain volume loss is primarily due to MS because the brain volume loss in younger individuals is not particularly great. Uh, unless they have some condition like MS or something else. As people age, brain volume loss is actually more importantly related to just aging. So the issue with progressive MS, again, to go back to that for a moment, so we can think of progressive MS as taking aging and plopping it onto the back of MS. And it's manifested pretty discreetly with brain volume loss. And so... Um, we're not sure why some people get progressive MS and have more brain volume loss or more spine volume loss compared to others. 
It's also true that we, you know, we, we know there's chronological age. Uh, I turn 70 tomorrow. That's my chronological age. And, um, but my, what is my biological age? And you can measure biological age a number of different ways. Um, one is just by the length of the arms of chromosomes. Uh, they're so-called telomeres. Telomer length can tell you a lot about biologically what's going, inside, uh, going on inside cells. And so there are a number of other things you can look at that can get at biological aging. And there's emerging data that perhaps it is the case that those who end up having progressive MS, when you take aging and plop it onto the back of MS, are people who have more rapid biological aging compared to their chronological age. So this is an emerging area of science. I don't claim at all to be an expert in it, um, but there was a woman at the University of California, San Diego, who is, so she's the one who usually gives that talk. Uh, but that's a very important concept uh, that we can think of that might explain a lot of why there are differences between people uh, with regard to progressive MS. Um, oh, sure, go ahead, Gary. Uh, on, the, on the brain, in spine volume, I, and I understand the, the brain volume, if it shrinks, you got more room for the brain to rattle around in the skull up there. So you're much more susceptible to falls and things like that. You're gonna lose little corpuscles and blood vessels. Yeah. Uh, how, does, how does shrinkage of the spine manifest itself? Yeah, so shrinkage, uh, the question is, how is, uh, how is brain and sp spine shrinkage different? Uh, Gary alluded to one thing that's very important especially in older individuals, forget MS for a moment, but older individuals in general, as your brain shrinks, uh, that's exactly right. Your brain does rattle around in there a little bit and you have blood vessels that go out to the surface uh, of your brain and also then cross and go out to the lining of the brain, the meninges. And those blood vessels sit in there and they become very susceptible to wobble. Uh, they're very sort of fixed when your brain is full, but the less full and the more they pull away that the brain pulls away from the skull, they're floating in space. So any kind of torsional movement, torque, especially with a fall hitting your head, boom, you can bleed and have either a subdural hemorrhage or an epidural hemorrhage. So for us, our patients have significant fall risk quite frequently, and that is a major concern. So that's the major reason we hate falls are two, broken bones and broken blood vessels. In the spine, it's a little less obvious, but that the spine carries, essentially, it's a large tube that carries uh, sensory and motor fibers. It has some other types of fibers, but essentially, um, a lesion that you have in your spine is going to be much more obvious than most lesions that you have in your brain because it's going to either cause some sensory abnormality or motor abnormality. And so how we see that manifested most clearly is with slow, progressive weakness of walking, strength in the legs, bowel and bladder function. And then also if it's high enough affecting your arms as well. So um, uh, the, the abnormalities that we see just pathologically with the spine are much more obviously seen uh, with people who use canes, walkers, wheelchairs, compared to the cognitive function that people have primarily more brain problems, which actually is uh, most noted by the individual themselves and less noticeable to others. So uh, if, yeah, you, if you have bowel issues, you might attribute that to shrinkage of the spine and use bowel and, and uh, uh, balance issues. All those things. Yeah. All of them. Okay. Anything, anything that's uh, related to that. So bowel, bladder, sex, walking, strength, uh, all of those for sure. Um, uh, there was a question that uh, uh, gets at a very important issue. Uh, about cognitive testing. Uh, could cognitive testing with the symbol digit modality test, the SDMT, or similarly validated cognitive test, uh, could that be added to the annual neurological assessment and then used as a quantitative measure as a reference going forward? And the answer is absolutely. And that's not the only one. There are many, many others that you could use. Uh, you can use a 25 foot time walk uh, for uh, leg function. You could use a nine hole peg test that is you do it with both hands. How, how fast can you take a peg from this nine holes to this nine holes over here and you move all nine of them? Um, you could do um, a more global score. I mentioned the EDSS before. We perform the EDSS, but there's a validated measure um, called the PDDS, the Patient Determined Disease Steps, 
that correlates extremely well with the EDSS. So actually, when you come to our office, we get your PDDS because the patient fills it out ahead of time. And then it goes right into your chart. And we have a graph that shows what it's looked like uh, for the last three visits. So we can look at your PDDS. So the utility of any and all of those things is that you can have a graphical interpretation of what's been going on with the patient and using some combination of what the patient tells us and using things like that, you would presumably have a much better idea of how someone is doing than simply just saying, how are you doing today? And uh, the problem with any and all of those though, is that, and I'm sorry, let me go backwards. You can also add to that a whole series of other things beyond the SDMT. You can also add patient reported outcomes, MS symptom checklists, uh, patient reported outcomes related to quality of life, fatigue, and a whole bunch of other things. There's a lot of things you could measure. The issue is uh, sort of in our, in our world is uh, you could tabulate a lot of data, uh, but it takes time, it takes money, it is frequently not reimbursed, and then you have a bunch of data to manage. And so uh, it requires a, a really um, substantial effort to do that and uh, most uh, practices, including our own, really don't do it as systematically as we would like. I can tell you what they do at the Cleveland Clinic, though. When you walk into the Cleveland Clinic, you walk in and you walk into a big bullpen about the size of this room. And you get your vital signs and you answer a few questions about, like, what would you like to talk about with the doctor today? And then you do your nine hole peg test, your 25 foot time walk, your SDMT. And I think they do a couple of other patient reporter outcomes uh, as well. And they, I think they do the PDDS as well. Uh, and all of that stuff is gathered um, and they are able to do that for a couple of reasons. One, financially, they're in a circumstance that is a relatively unique. They have their own building and they have their own source of funds because they get, I hesitate to use the word kickback, but they get a, a partial reimbursement for all the MRI scans that they order and all of the infusions that they do. So they can hire a lot more people than someone can in a basic uh, private practice. And so uh, they have set up their system that it's like a funnel that you go through when you come in and they do all that every time you see them. And that's typically every six months. So it would be, uh, it would be great if we had sort of a, a structural system in place that allowed everybody to do that but it's hard. So what we've, what we've chosen to do so far is to use the one major measure, um, the PDDS, because the PDDS correlates very well with the EDSS and it covers a number of different spectrums and it's patient reported. So it's easy to do. And we were able to put it right into our electronic medical record system called Epic, which is the most commonly used one in large centers like ours. Um, and, um, uh, and we have the capacity to do that. But that's um, modest and compared to what they're doing at Cleveland Clinic. So uh, all those things would be very good. And I think if we had a better system in place, and I think they do this better in Europe as well, because uh, a lot of them are national health services and they, you know, they ask the doctors how they want it set up and that's how they set it up and they do it. Um, uh, so I think that they, they are supported better. Uh, we're in sort of a eat what you kill, you know, fee for service model in the United States. And it's all a chunk of this and a chunk of that and whatever you'll get the insurance to pay for, as opposed to looking at it more globally from the patient's point of view as to what would be the best. The places that do the best with this probably are in places like Kaiser, uh, the VA, which are integrated systems. Um, they care about you from the moment you walk in to the time you leave. And, uh, and so, uh, for example, I was a VA doctor for 17 years and, uh, and everybody with MS would come in uh, to the rehab group once a year and they would have everything done. They would also have a bladder ultrasound done. They would have, um, uh, I'm trying to think what else they would have done. They would have a variety of things done in addition to the kinds of things that I just mentioned because the VA pays for you for everything. If you go to a nursing home, they're paying for that. Um, if you have, uh, you know, United Healthcare, uh, no, they're not paying for your, they're not paying for your, they have no motivation to stop you from going into a, a nursing home, for example, they're not paying for it. 
an integrated system like that, or, uh, or even Kaiser, where they're not paying for the nursing home, they're still very motivated to try to control the costs and whatever, and those integrated systems uh, do better. I mean, even so much so that Kaiser has a, um, a large integrated system uh, that they did between the doctors and the pharmacists to come up with a unique way to try to improve getting people on more highly effective therapies and also limiting their costs. And I won't go through the whole details with you, but they're able to save in Southern California alone about $100 million a year and uh, convert about 10% of people on highly effective therapy for MS into about 80%. And they did that over about a five-year period of time. So um, in an integrated system, you can do that. We don't have integrated systems in the United States. We have disintegrated ones. And that is a structural problem. Um, so let's see what else do I have here. Um, all right, there are a few other, how are we doing on time? Okay. I'm going to run out of questions. You guys got to come up with stuff or I have to start rambling. Um, so there are a couple other questions that were added today. One had to do with cold sensitivity. Um, it is true that some of our patients do have cold sensitivity. Um, uh, the more common issue is typically heat sensitivity. And as I mentioned before, uh, that when you get overheated, you raise your body core temperature, you can see very either subtle or very overt changes and fluctuations in your symptoms. And that's because it's well known that if you take, uh, if you take a nerve out of a squid or out of a, uh, a mouse or whatever, and you put it in a bath and you run electricity through it and measure the speed of conduction, it will go at whatever rate it goes. Um, but then also, if you um, partially damage the nerve, it will still conduct electricity. De partially demyelinate it will, will conduct less electricity, maybe not quite as fast, but pretty close. But then when you raise the temperature inside the bath, it'll block. It will not conduct through a partially damaged nerve. So this has been known for years and is the, is the physiologic explanation for why overheating results in change in your symptoms. So uh, what about cold sensitivity though? Well, cold sensitivity, uh, that's not used to the issue. I mean, we, we don't have a good handle on why people have that. I think there's two broad possibilities as to why you might have some increase in symptoms um, with cold for some people. Uh, one is you could just have other problems. So for example, people with arthritis do very bad in the cold. Um, and so you could have, you could have just a simply a, another issue that's on top of your MS. Second possibility is that there are very um, small unmyelinated fibers in your body that's called the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. We have actually multiple different nervous systems inside our body. And, and this, uh, these two uh, can comprise what's known as the autonomic nervous system. And they control, for example, um, pupils getting big when you go into the dark and small when you go into the light. They control sweating. Uh, they control pilot erection, your hair standing on end, uh, controls a lot of your gut movements, controls heart rate and blood pressure control, all these things that are automatic that you really don't voluntarily control very much. So you could call it the automatic nervous system as well. Well, these fibers, especially the ones that they, this starts all the way up in your hypothalamus in the middle of your brain, it comes down to your spinal cord, distributed throughout your body. Uh, these can be damaged quite substantially, these fibers um, in your spinal cord. And then uh, that can contribute to a lot of different problems that people have. And so it is also possible that the fibers that are controlling uh, going to your um, skin to the blood vessels of your skin, of which there are many, uh, those fibers can be damaged. And these are the ones that either make your blood vessels get bigger and more blood flow goes to the extremities and you warm the extremities, but you cool the interior because you don't have as much warm blood in the interior. It's going all out to the extremities. These are the crazy guys in the football games in the, on Christmas day. And they're out, you know, they're outside alcohol is involved and they take their shirt off at zero degree temperature and they're perfectly happy as a clam. Uh, not really. And they're probably going to get hypothermic because what they're doing is they're sending a lot of blood 
they're redistributing a lot of blood to their periphery and their core is really getting cold. And that's when they get into trouble. But they feel fine because their, their skin is relatively hanging on there uh, because of the alcohol. But actually what you really need to be doing is you really need to be conserving your core temperature because that's what's going to cause the problem. So uh, it's not a good thing to go out in the cold and drink a lot of alcohol and take your shirt off. Um, so uh, that's one thing you can take away from today. So, uh, so there could be problems uh, related to um, the autonomic nervous system and distribution of blood flow that could also then give you more cold sensitivity. And the, the person asked specifically about uh, things like, um, well, I'm, uh, I'll just leave it at that. So that would be one way that you could have cold sensitivity. And the other could be that you just have a different problem. Um, sort of related to that, um, someone asked a question about new medications. And it was sort of a broad question about uh, for walking and for uh, shaking and spasms. Um, in a broad sense, uh, we know that walking problems are very common in MS, and we know the spasms, um, either um, in, in just increased tone, spasticity, stiffness, especially when people walk, um, or spasms, involuntary movements that can be triggered by sometimes very small things, but oftentimes just when people go to bed at night and they get off their legs, and when they go horizontal, there's something about um, causing these involuntary jerks that can occur. Um, there are no new medications related to those particular issues, but there are a variety of things that we can do uh, that are addressing, uh, are addressing those things. So for uh, spasticity and for spasms, um, uh, you can do a number of things, including uh, just stretching, especially if people, a lot of people have increased uh, tone spasticity at night before they go to bed or when they get into bed. Make sure you stretch in the morning when you get up and, and in the evening when you're going to bed. Um, there are a variety of different medications that have been used for years. Um, there aren't any really new ones uh, for the last 25 or 30 years, but we're using things a little bit uh, more um, judiciously and better. Uh, we also use Botox. Uh, Botox was originally used to decrease uh, tone, especially if you ever saw people walked around with a cervical dystonia that people had their neck all the way hooked over like this. That's because of increased tone in the muscles of the neck. They have a cervical dystonia. And you put Botox in there, relax the muscles, and boom, you can put the head up straight. So you can do the same thing in the legs and the same thing in the arms, except the leg is really big. And if you have both legs and increased tone in multiple muscle groups, that can be a lot of injections in your legs. If it's really focal in one or two muscle groups, it's usually a little bit easier. So you can use that. You can also use baclofen pumps. So you can, baclofen is an oral medication, a classic drug we've used for many years to try to treat spasticity and spasms. And you can, uh, for those who just are having more ongoing tone in spite of using that, you can put a hockey puck size, it's literally almost exactly the size of a hockey puck, um, underneath the skin and it's got a computer inside of it and it's got a port uh, and you can refill it through the skin and you can also put dye into it to run through the tube that goes around to your back and threads over to your spine to actually test to make sure the system is working but most importantly the the tube goes around and it's impaled through the uh, the dura the meninges on the outside uh, of the spinal cord and you thread it up and then you sew it in and this delivers tiny, tiny amounts, one one thousandth of the dose of baclofen directly onto the spinal cord and is incredibly effective. But of course, then you have this computer in your abdomen and it requires refilling and maintenance. You have to change it out every seven or so years. And um, uh, in many respects, when you know, when you see TV shows uh, and they're talking about medicine, they say, this is our last opportunity. Well, back from pumps are typically our last opportunity because no one really wants to go to that first. And most people don't need that. And they can get control of their spasms and their spasticity using oral medications, stretching, and then also sometimes Botox. But there hasn't been anything really dramatically new in that realm uh, for a while. There was one very specific question about decongestants and are they okay? 
to use with MS medications? And in general, the answer to that is yes. I would also just comment that um, uh, one of the drugs that has been tested uh, for remyelination, that is to uh, regrow myelin on damaged um, nerves, uh, is clomastine, which is an over-the-counter um, oral decongestant. And so, um, uh, so A, it does not cause any problems specifically with, uh, with MS and with um, MS therapies. Uh, B, uh, the problem with decongestants is that they can be um, quite sedating. And C, then in the clomastine trial, um, they used a dose, I think it was 20 milligrams a day, that was so high that a lot of people got very sedated. And then conversely, it, it, although it showed you can measure, and this is what I mentioned before, you can measure some uh, increase in the speed of conduction with a visual vocal potential. You could measure some stuff on the MRI scan, but that did not translate. In this case, it was looking at the optic nerves. It did not translate into improved acuity of vision. And so, although it was a proof of principle that you might be able to do something, the side effects were substantial and the benefit was very marginal uh, and really nothing clinical. Uh, but decongestants on the whole are fine, just have to watch out because they are sedating and our patients are particularly susceptible to sedation uh, because they essentially have had a brain trauma with their MS. And we also have to think about that in a similar vein, oftentimes with um, anesthesia, it's fine to get anesthesia, but I think it's in general a better choice from my point of view if you need some kind of procedure done to have a regional uh, anesthesia. For example, if you can have a shoulder operation, you can have a scaling block as opposed to getting a tube put down your throat and getting uh, you know, a, a, an inhaled uh, anesthetic. Our patients just take longer to sort of come out of their anesthesia or they should really just try and use lower doses. Uh, it's fine to do it if you need a surgery to replace your hip or something. You're going to get, you know, you're going to get a ventilated um, anesthetic, and that's fine. Um, I do have a couple questions from online. Okay. Uh, it seems like many symptoms can be associated with MS, and it feels easy to become hypersensitive to changes or new feelings. Is it possible to determine whether symptoms are caused by MS versus something else? For example, dizziness. Yeah. And depends. Uh, so thank you for picking the absolute least favorite word in the dictionary for me. Um, dizziness. Dizziness means so many things to different people. And in fact, different, uh, different things to even the same person uh, if they have different kinds of feelings. Um, so A, uh, part A of that question is that's our job. Our job is to figure out, do you need a hip replacement or is that your MS talking with regard to your gait? Uh, that's one example. That's a common example. But there are others as well. You know, same thing for um, sleep disturbance. Uh, same thing for fatigue. The number of things that cause fatigue is incredibly long. And so when we see someone with fatigue, and MS is a very common cause of fatigue, what we do is we go through and look at all those other things that can be causing fatigue. We try and point, you know, if we can identify those things, identify them and then treat them. Uh, because uh, if someone has obstructive sleep apnea, that's something that's treatable. If someone's taking medications that are causing them, that's treatable. Uh, if someone is sleeping uh, with a dog in their bed that wakes them up every night, that's treatable. Um, so we try to identify all the things that are affecting, uh, in this case, fatigue. And that is, in fact, our job. So um, that, that is a main thing that we do all the time. I'm sorry, the second part of that question was... Um, I think you covered it. Just is it possible to determine, um, and maybe just a note about how sensitive people should be, oh, what they should be yeah, tracking? So that, that was the part I wanted to answer. So um, the most challenging time for someone in many respects with regard to any chronic condition, certainly for multiple sclerosis, is when they are first diagnosed. Uh, most people haven't really thought about MS too much unless they have it in their family, and uh, they don't know that much about it. And um, people are people, they wanna get educated um, and they will uh, try and get as much education as they can and try and figure that out. And they pay a huge amount of attention to their bodies at that time. And the biggest question is just that question, 
that is, is this an MS issue or is this a something else issue? And, uh, and we want people to be paying attention to their body, but it is normal to almost overreact in that sense. And that's okay. It's, it's not a problem. If, if you call us up concerned about a problem, we're happy to have that discussion. But um, oftentimes it is something else. And so um, uh, a lot of that has to do with the uncertainty factor that's associated with any chronic condition and absolutely with MS. As everybody in this room knows, you are healthy until you're not. And that not can happen very rapidly. So it's not as rapid as like a stroke or a heart attack, but you could be a healthy 27 year old woman and you wake up the next day and you got a blurry vision in one eye. And so um, the uncertainty of not knowing if that can happen again and noting the disruption you've had with your life with whatever you had before, that uncertainty makes people anxious and makes them really pay attention to symptoms. So it's okay. We want people to pay attention to their symptoms. We want them to, pay, you know, to do, do the best they can for their body. And they will begin to get comfortable over time uh, understanding what really is important to talk about quickly and what is maybe not as important. But with regard to dizziness specifically, dizziness means a million things. It could be vertigo. It could be imbalance. It can be lightheadedness when you stand up. It could be, uh, I ate something wrong for breakfast. It could be any of a variety of things. So um, I never let people use that word in the office. They have to tell me something. It's say what you're saying, but use different words. And, um, and then we can sort of get at what it is. And oftentimes it is um, uh, something else. And oftentimes the most common, especially after the age of 50, is benign positional, positional vertigo. So uh, that's a vestibular dysfunction. The inner ear uh, has uh, improper signaling that occurs that makes your body wobble and or literally sometimes spin around when you have vertigo. Sure, go ahead. We have a question behind you. And, and I'm sorry if you already covered this, but you keep saying we, and, and then you're talking about going to your doctor. Um, do it, who are you with again? I'm sorry, like, so are, is it like a specialist we're, center? Yeah, we're at the University of Colorado, Rock okay. Mountain MS Center at University of Colorado. So, because I, I guess I just wanted to confirm, um, I think we often do have people like, I guess my question is, do you know how the healthcare system is? Like you seem very knowledgeable, like, oh, we'll figure out what is, whether it's dizziness or another, or, you know, another thing going on. How do you feel the doctors are informed of that? Like, so it's going to be like everything else, very variable. Uh, the problem uh, with the, you know, this is a problem around the world is that, um, uh, education is very variable and it's also um, very different in different places. If you're in Ireland, 80% of doctors are GPs. If you have MS, you may go to, a, you may go to an MS doctor once and that's about it. Um, National Health Service in England is not terribly different. In the United States, about 60 to 75% of doctors are specialists. And then, there's a, and then there are those of us who are sub sub specialists. And then there are those of us who are sub 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 specialists, like Dr. Bennett, who's a neuro ophthalmologist. So, um, uh, I would say, and I say this all the time to my patients I cheat. I try and take care of one disease. It is a lot harder to be a generalist and the divide that we have, you know, we have a lot of divides and a lot of inequality in the United States by age, by sex, by race, ethnicity, and all sorts of other things. But a big one we don't talk about very much is urban versus rural. It is very hard for people in small towns to make a living if you're a doctor. It's, it's generally held that a physician, a neurologist, in order to be able to make a living needs at least a population of 50,000 people. It makes it very, very difficult. And then you got to take care of migraines and strokes, myasthenia gravis, epilepsy, and who knows what else. I have the luxury of dealing with a very finite number of conditions, 95% of which is MS. So if I don't know more than a general neurologist and tremendously more than a general doctor, I should really quit. But I'm cheap. I'm taking the easy way out. They have a much harder job. It's a very, very hard job. And that is a huge divide that we really don't talk about much, but that is the major divide. Uh, paper was just published by one of our colleagues at Cleveland Clinic. 
about uh, neurology deserts for MS patients in the United States. And I forget the number. Do you remember the number, Kelsey? It's, it's an impressive number, but something like 40% of people don't even have access within, I think they use a radius of 80 miles um, to a general neurologist. Forget uh, MS specialists. If you made an MS specialist, it'd probably be 80% of people. So we have people that drive hours and hours to see us. And, you know, and I don't claim to be any smarter than anybody else. I claim that I cheat. I take care of one problem. Uh, I would also like to plug all of our education programs um, right now. So that's one reason that we have the nonprofit side of the Rocky Mountain MS Center is so that even folks who aren't seeing a specialty neurologist can get this information, can find out about the latest studies, and then ask their doctors. So if you have friends or folks in a support group who are unaware of us, aren't on our mailing list, please share our information. Um, all of our education programs, again, are free and we love getting new people. I'm going to come back to you. We had one more. Oh, okay. I just wondered if telemedicine uh, had helped that situation. Yeah, absolutely. Telemedicine has helped a lot. So telemedicine has helped. These kinds of things have helped. Um, webinars have helped. Um, and so that, uh, you know, they're... Uh, Obama wasn't the first person to say it, but he was the one who said it um, uh, the most uh, recently. Uh, you should never let a bad disaster uh, go on without learning something important from it. And with the pandemic, we learned pretty fast that we could do telemedicine. At our place, I mean, telemedicine as a whole accounted for less than 2% of all of our visits in 19, 2019. In 2020, after March, between March and July, it accounted for in our department in neurology, 90% in a matter of a couple of months. And we had in our entire UC Health system, we were the second largest users of telehealth. And, and neurology accounts for like 4% of all doctors or something. Our group, just in our, uh, our department in neurology, not just the MS group, but all the stroke and everybody else doctors, uh, we accounted for second most in the entire UC Health system. And so uh, we still have 25 to 30% of our practice is telehealth. Um, and so the other thing you have to recognize is that um, we have this convenient uh, little lines that we draw around people called states, but uh, licensure requires us to get licensed in multiple states to cross those little lines. So then you have to have malpractice in those states as well. So, I mean, you guys know this, you live in Colorado, you can throw a dart at Colorado and or Denver in specific, and then you can do a pro protractor around there from about 500 miles and you don't see a big city. So if you wanna to go to the next biggest MS center going north, you gotta to go to another country, you have to go to Calgary. So um, the reality is, is that telehealth has helped using educational stuff like this has helped, but it still is a limitation. And for us, we still have to periodically examine people. And when, it's, when you're newly diagnosing somebody, you definitely, uh, the exam is extremely important. Over time, it's much less important, but uh, uh, telehealth has absolutely helped a lot. You talked about slow, uh, shrinkage of the spine. How do we slow that? Same way you do anything else, use highly effective therapies. Of all the things that we know of that can sh uh, slow shrinkage of the spine and or brain, the disease modifying therapies are. And so the reason why we are so, there's two big reasons why we're, we're so, um, that our group and then finally others have also agreed to use the most highly effective therapy when someone is newly diagnosed. The first is that it's just the best thing that we know of to do that. The second is, by the time we diagnose somebody, the average person comes in to see us and they already have 20 to 30 brain lesions. This is a condition that's been ongoing already for probably several years before they ever have first symptoms. There is a prodrome that occurs before someone has an overt first symptom. Uh, and we're trying to figure out how we can get at that uh, in a study that we call Rise and Dreams, uh, Rise for Adults, Dreams for Kids or trying to identify the very first signs uh, and markers in first degree, asymptomatic first degree relatives of people with MS because they're at high risk of developing MS. 
So picking a high risk population and then trying to say, okay, where are the clues before they have symptoms? And that's exactly what we're trying to figure out. So those two reasons though, MS, the meds are the best when used when, as soon as possible. And two, we know for the vast majority of people that MS has already been going on for a while before we ever see them. And then do you have any suggestions on how to improve sleep? Yes, depends on what the problem is. So a lot of people have interrupted sleep. So the stuff that's um, unrelated to MS, uh, the dog like before, uh, snoring husband, um, other things, <laughs> sleep in a different bed. Um, so, uh, so some of the things are, are sort of more obvious. Um, you can have a, a primary sleep disorder of yourself, obstructive sleep apnea, periodic lead movements of sleep, REM sleep disorder, or a variety of others. Uh, so you try to potentially do a sleep study. Um, you may have an obvious MS-related problem. That is, you may have to get up and go to the bathroom three times. Um, so we have to work on, you know, what can we do to uh, help you with that? Uh, you may have pain that wakes you up. You may have spasticity that wakes you up. So there are symptoms that we may have to treat related to that. You may have a primary mood disorder, uh, sleep disruptions, hugely prominent in anxiety and depression. So you may have to get that treated. You may be taking medications that are uh, that are interfering. You may be taking stimulants to treat your fatigue, and then you can't go to sleep at night. So now you're taking sleeping agents. You know, you're taking doggy downers at night and puppy uppers in the morning. And that's not so good. That's a bad cycle. We don't like that cycle. Um, so uh, the other thing, though, the number one thing that probably helps with sleep is exercise. So, uh, but also if you have of a primary insomnia. There are a variety of things that people can do for a primary. Uh, most of the time, this goes to the primary care doc, but anxiety and uh, more efficient ways of. Um, and so there's a number of things, it just depends on what's going on. So when we talk about sleep and fatigue, it's always like this as sleep is the number one thing that really leads to fatigue, which is the number one symptom for MS patients. So we talk about sleep a lot. Uh, there was one more question about cannabis, which I think you can get to in the minutes we have left. Yep. So the cannabis question was, uh, hey, how come we're not prescribing cannabis? Well, there's a simple reason. Uh, that's not the way it works in Colorado. The way it works in Colorado, where uh, both uh, recreational and medical marijuana are legal, is that you can, if you're 18, you're no, 21. It's 21, I think. 21, you can walk in and you can just buy pot. Or some variation, you can buy an edible, you can buy any of a number of CBD products or other things. Um, the only thing that get it, getting certified for use uh, medicinally is that you pay less taxes, you pay a lower tax. So there is a financial advantage to get the certification. But the amazing thing that happened is as soon as uh, recreational marijuana became available in Colorado, the number of people seeking medical certificates dropped by like 85% or something, because most of them were being uh, given to men between the age of 21 and 25. So um, maybe not the most common medicinal use. Um, and uh, in our patients, uh, there is not a lot of data, really strong control, you know, show me a prospective study for any of, it, of the indications. That said, a lot of our patients do use cannabis. And in my experience, just uh, from listening to many people, the things that they have benefited the most from is with regard to sleep, because uh, it has, can be sedating. Um, as well as anxiety, although sometimes take like a lot of marijuana, you certainly can enhance anxiety, but it can help with anxiety. Um, and uh, sometimes with pain, there is data, the vaporized version of uh, marijuana, which is proved in both Canada and in the UK, um, the name's escaping me right now, but that vaporized version is uh, useful for spasticity. It's not a great spasticity drug, but for people that fail back within and other things that has been used and is approved. So, um, so we do use it, um, but we don't prescribe it because that's not just not the way the system works. I have no problem with people using marijuana. What I usually suggest is that if you think it might be helpful for you, for you that's fine. You have the luxury in Colorado of using that, but to do it intelligently, that is start very low, uh, do it for a defined period of time and try to measure something. So if you're doing it for sleep, measure your sleep. I have on my watch, I, I get wake up every morning. If they tell me how long I slept, um, that's extremely useful. And you can find out how much REM sleep you're getting, how much deep sleep you're getting. 
So measure something and, uh, and then you can adjust the dose and just do it like you would do it with any other medication that you use, except this one that you're sort of more controlling because I'm not writing prescription. Um, one more question from online. This person was diagnosed two weeks ago in an active flare up and haven't, hasn't started any maintenance medication. Yep. Do you have any supplement medication injection suggestions to help relieve symptoms such as numbness and tingles in lower extremities? Um, and in addition, is there any benefit to B12 shots? Uh, that's a mouthful. Uh, so it's not clear exactly what happened. It sounds like they had a transverse myelitis if they have numbness and tingling in their extremities. That's the most common first set of symptoms that we see with MS, uh, even more common than an optic neuritis. And so, um, uh, so there's, no, um, there's no great therapy. Uh, so let me go backwards. Um, acutely, um, even if it's only sensory symptoms, uh, they can still be disabling. Um, if there's any kind of motor symptoms with it, it's probably more disabling. And so the, in the short run, uh, high dose steroids are used to try to uh, break up that first attack. And that's important. Second is to treat the symptoms as they allude to. Uh, you might be able to treat symptoms with uh, gabapentin and a variety of other medications. Uh, in my experience, uh, they, they do better if there's actually pain associated with that numbness and tingling the medication just works better. Um, and the side effects of sedation and weight gain are not that great. So um, uh, we, don't, we generally don't use it a lot for numbness and healing, I think. And what was the other set of symptoms they had in the last part? Oh, B12. Uh, there's no evidence that B12 does anything for multiple sclerosis. If you are B12 deficient, which can also cause numbness and tingling and can also cause a spinal cord syndrome and can also cause lesions in the spine, then, then treating B12 deficiency does matter. The only vitamin that we know that is linked to risk of developing MS is vitamin D. And so um, uh, when people are newly diagnosed, probably 85 to 90% are vitamin D deficient and taking a vitamin D supplement um, probably is beneficial, although it's been extremely difficult to prove that that's the case. It's pretty clear that low vitamin D is a risk factor for developing MS and also a risk factor for having worse MS. It has not been proven that taking supplements um, and comparing those who go up in their levels compared to those who do not go up in their levels makes a difference in how you do over five to 10 years. Though that's just a really hard study to do and no one's done it yet. So uh, the other thing I would say is uh, the most important thing is all the things I said before about lifestyle, uh, treating comorbidities, et cetera, but getting on a highly effective therapy as quickly as possible. And our phone number is 720-848-2080. Thank you, Dr. Corboy. Thank you everyone for your fantastic questions, for spending your evening with us. Um, I did have a couple of things to note. Uh, our next education summit, save the date, will be November 16th. Um, we will be doing at least one presentation on research updates, particularly those coming out of the big Congress happening in Europe, um, coming right up. We also have a couple of resources that I think might be interesting based on tonight's conversation. Um, we did a webinar um, with a neuropsychologist last December or January, um, so you can find that on our YouTube channel. And then last November, Dr. Anna Shaw also did a presentation on cognition and MS, which she goes quite a bit into sleep as well. Um, so those are some fantastic resources, again, available on our YouTube. Um, or if you want to send me an email and say, hey, I just remember you said something about this, um, my email address is education at mscenter.org, um, and I'm happy to send you those direct links. So again, thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Corboy, for spending your last night of your 60s with us, That's right. and have a great night.